farmland uh, uh, as we continue to be able to sprawl and really rewarding the automobile as a way to be able to uh, have all of our transport. Um, in the late seven, uh, 60s, pardon me, um, a really uh, a, a very uh, environmental awakening across the United States, but particularly within the Oregon area, um, there was a sense that um, we were really the, the Eden, the promised land, and we had to do something to be able to protect that. Um, our governor at the time, the, the uh, somewhat like premier uh, position uh, uh, for the state of Oregon, um, really made it very clear that uh, we should create an urban growth boundary. Uh, and that urban growth boundary at that point was not aimed at making denser development, though that has certainly been the result and has been very, very important. It was aimed at uh, protecting prime uh, agricultural and forest lands uh, and the soils on which those, uh, those uh, commodities could be grown. Um, and uh, um, that uh, comprehensive approach uh, uh, to land use, uh, really thinking about a different way of uh, stopping a major freeway that was about to be built um, and turning those dollars into uh, public transport investments uh, as well as highway, really led to a very, very different approach. And what we really concluded was that we can, if we plan well, if we really have vision, we can create a community that isn't uh, auto-dependent, that really is a, a community that's based on the quality of life, that's based on neighborhoods and communities, the interaction of, of people with their environment. And it is that uh, uh, concept that has really uh, led to what we've been able to accomplish. And although some uh, cynics will re refer to us now and then as the practically perfect Portland, uh, uh, there are many lessons that uh, we wish we could do over again as well. Um, well, let me uh, begin. I, mean, I have a, a, a number of slides here that, uh, so there we go, um, that are going to tell some of that, uh, that Portland story and some of the things that we've really learned. Um, first is um, that we really wanted alternatives to uh, driving, um, not to be that auto-dependent. And what you have here is that uh, we look very closely at what, our, what we call our choice riders. That is, riders uh, on our tr public transit system who have a vehicle or access to a vehicle um, or have in fact chosen not to have a vehicle because they want to be able to ride us. Uh, and use that to, uh, along with bicycling and walking as their transport mode. Eighty percent of our riders are those choice riders. And what it does mean for a public transport system is that we're com constantly competing against the automobile. But it also says that our riders are wanting a different uh, set of choices about how they can get along around. Uh, Forty-three percent, as you see there on the, on the chart, um, actually of our adults ride at least twice a month. Uh, and hopefully that's to more than just sporting events, um, but also utilized uh, uh, really for getting around in the community. Overall, over 200,000 car trips uh, uh, a day are being eliminated, 300 million vehicle miles per year. And I'll come back to that a little bit in, the, in terms of, uh, of carbon and, and what that can mean. Um, next really is that we looked at, at our transit system and said, you know, it's more than just the movement of people from point A to point B. It's really a total transit system. First, obviously, and importantly, is the service. Um, it, uh, what we call frequent service, it must be frequent, it must be reliable. And for us, frequent service is uh, a, a little different than what you have here. It's somewhat the go uh, bus. But we have really said that it is a service that, uh, in terms of our bus service, uh, on the 16 lines on which uh, it is uh, used. Um, it is a service that comes every 15 minutes, at least, if not faster. It is during rush hour, it is all day long, it is in the evening, and it is on Saturdays and on Sundays. And what's so important about that is um, that you don't have to be able to think about whether you're going to have bus service uh, or light rail service. You can go out to the stop and on average, you're not going to wait anything more than seven and a half minutes. Uh, and more importantly, you don't have to think, ah, this is Saturday, does that mean it only comes every half hour? Or is it Sunday, does it even come at all? It is something that can be counted on and reliable. Access, tremendously important. You must have pedestrian and bicycle access that is safe. 
um, that uh, we do have a limited number of park and rides. So it, it serves about 7% of our ridership. And certainly one of the debates you'll be having if you're developing transit-oriented developments, and I've already been a part of some of this, is how much uh, should park and rides really uh, be uh, a part of, a, of your uh, system? It needs to be a part of it. But uh, I will compare ourselves in the Portland region to the Denver, uh, Colorado area. Uh, there, um, upwards of 40% of their riders are in fact accessing through park and rides the data, the most recent data that I have seen. Um, but more importantly, what it has done is by putting in lots and lots of park and ride, it has essentially allowed the sprawling uh, development patterns that have been there to be able to continue. Because all you have to do is to have more park and rides that people can access. It doesn't allow and doesn't provide for that con convenient pedestrian or bicycle um, connections to transit that really makes for communities and neighborhoods. Amenities. You have to have shelters. Certainly in our uh, area, it rains a lot, something that you would like every now and then. Uh, to borrow some of our rain, we'd like to give you some of it as well. Uh, but it, uh, it's, uh, it means that the shelters are very important. Um, obviously, during the hot sun, uh, shelters are important here as well. Um, and new vehicles, uh, something, by the way, I'm very impressed with um, and very jealous of uh, the amount of uh, new vehicles uh, that are in your system. Uh, it is exciting. And lastly, and very important, is customer information. People want to know um, how to be able to access the system, how to be able to do that trip plan, how to be able to get around, uh, uh, and uh, is it going to be convenient. Uh, a part of that is our providing transit tracker information, what we call transit tracker. Really what it is is it's next bus uh, or next train information. And what it does is, it isn't the schedule time that the arrival will be, but actually it's a countdown in minutes using our global positioning system uh, on our buses and our light rail vehicles. Uh, we get over 1.4 million calls uh, to this. It can be accessed, by the way, by, uh, from any one of our almost 8,000 stops. It can be accessed by your home computer, so you can kind of set it up to be able to know when you have to leave the, the house to get, go get your bus uh, or train. Uh, or your office, uh, I have been known to be able to cut up a little too close and miss my bus, uh, 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 just getting one last bit of work done or, or something of that ilk. Uh, but uh, you can also do it by calling on your cell phone from any one of our uh, stations uh, or bus, uh, uh, bus stops. Um, and that, as I said, 1.4 million calls per month utilizing that uh, service. And, you know, it doesn't come as a surprise. I mean, all of us, we're at the local grocery store. And, you know, we, we look at the lines that are uh, forming uh, uh, at the checkout.